Harris. Mon ami. Mes amis. It is my proud duty to stand up here and introduce to you Mr. Eli Nyberger, who is the Deputy Director of the Ann Arbor District Library. Eli has been a part of I Lead You from the beginning. He is as close to a rock star as librarianship gets. <laughs> so everyone, take a photo with him. Uh, I'm going to read his whole blurb because it's impressive as hell. Uh, Eli Nyberger joined the staff of the AADL as a help desk tech in 1997. It's been responsible for the, uh, the district library's technology program since 2000. His current director, I'm sorry, his current role is associate director for IT and production. Eli is responsible for technology planning, software development, digitization, events, and marketing. He's the author of Gamers in the Library, question mark, uh, published in, in 2007 by ALA, ALA Edition. It has spoken across the US, Europe, Australia about gaming, libraries, publishing, and the web. He serves on the board of Bricks for Brains, a small Lego educational uh, nonprofit, library renewal, working to develop e content solutions that work for libraries, and is the chairman of the Jai Foundation, working to bring internet powered telemedicine and economic development to rural communities in the developing world. And as a note, a friend of mine. So may I introduce Eli Nunders? How are you doing? Good. Thanks for coming. Before I get started, I want to take a quick census of the room. Raise your hand if you're not, if you don't work at a public library. I don't. Okay, put your hand down if you work at a, oh, put your hand up if you work at a school library. Okay, put your hand up if you work at an other kind of library. All right, great. Okay, so my talk today is called Delta Ahead, Diversifying the Value of Libraries. So I originally developed this talk for Lianza, which is the uh, New Zealand uh, Professional Association for Librarians. And they had a river theme for their conference, and they asked us all to use the river theme. So uh, I took that very literally. So I used a river to look at all of the different changes that have come and gone for libraries. And uh, because right now, we're at this point where it looks like there's a bend in the river and everything's changing. But I want to make the point that it's not really a bend. Things aren't really changing. There's a different opportunity for libraries. And uh, a lot of the conventional wisdom, a lot of the talking heads in the industry are wrong about everything. So I want to take a few minutes and go through some history uh, so we can all kind of have a good sense. So this is the Pearl River at the NASA Stennis Space Center in Mississippi. This is a, a sort of a man-made canal that is used to get big barges with rocket ships on them to launch pads and things like that. But I'm going to use it to represent the history of the written word, which started out with cuneiform a long time ago, clay tablets with things stomped into it. You can imagine uh, how heavily invested we were in that format, literally. Uh, then we went to mobile technology, things that you can take with you. What a crazy idea that was. And then came along the codex, and books started becoming extremely precious and valuable. And then we got to the letterpress, the uh, Gutenberg block printing. Uh, although, interestingly enough, we think a lot about Gutenberg, but you know, block printing was actually invented in Korea like hundreds of years before Gutenberg. So it's something that this is definitely the uh, Western-centric view of the birth of printing. Uh, it didn't really work out that way. Now granted, he didn't know what was going on over there, so he invented it independently. But this is the European model of where books came from, right? So we shouldn't forget that. But it was a very big deal, because what it did was it made books into a commodity, something that the more you made of them, the cheaper they were. Prior to this moment, books had a fixed cost. No matter how many of them you made, you still had to have monks slaving away in the darkness to make them. Right? So the cost did not, you had no economies of scale. They did not get cheaper the more you made. But as soon as this device came along, books immediately started getting cheaper the more you made of them. Economies of scale took over, it became a commodity. What is it that's unique about commodities? They're interchangeable, right? So we saw a lot of commodification of books over the past 500 years. We'll get back to that in a minute. But a lot of times, libraries get confused about what's happening to the book because we've seen other commoditized formats come and go. Most importantly, music. We think a lot about this because uh, many of us have seen so many format changes come and go just in our lifetimes. And just in the 20th century, it's basically the entire history of recording music. 
right? So it started out with the Edison cylinder, the wax cylinder. Have any of you seen the, uh, there's a wonderful video of Antiques Roadshow where a guy's holding a really precious wax cylinder. And he's like, this is one of the rarest wax, and he breaks it right on TV in front of everyone. Yeah, this is why these aren't in libraries still, is because it's an extremely fragile device. Oh. Then came the piano roll, and with it, the, uh, the first sort of like digital music, although it's very far ahead of its time. But man, the whole copyright landscape that we know now around music started with the piano roll, because they wanted to try to keep people from being able to duplicate their music. And the piano roll was a, it was essentially DRM for the, uh, the 1910s and the 20s. Then we got the 78, right, the sort of birth of the, the flat platter. That did really well for a while. We had the 45s, then we had the long plays, then we had the cassette, then we had the CD. All this stuff, one replaced the other almost completely, right? We all saw the CD pretty much end the cassette business permanently. Similarly, we all saw the DVD business eat the VHS business before our very eyes. And we saw VHS collections that we might have invested thousands and thousands of dollars in evaporate their value almost overnight, right? Anybody still circulating VHS tapes? Yeah, few? Yeah, we still got a couple of them. There's very few players left out there. And another thing about it is that VHS tapes have really crappy longevity. They fall apart really quickly. The little bits of flakes come off the tape. So it's really troubling. However, we also have this format war that we all just witnessed between Blu-ray and HD DVD. And if you bought on the wrong side of this equation, you got seriously screwed because these two formats were really fighting with each other and Blu-ray completely and totally triumphed and the HD DVD people went home with their tails between their legs. <laughs> but all of this, you know, we saw like, oh my God, formats, formats, they change really quick, never do the right one, all this stuff is changing really quickly. One will completely consume the other. And we think of our old friend, the LP, and how it went so gently into the sunset and how now it's gone forever, right? No. Oh, it's still here, it's cooler than ever. Look at this jerk. Listening to records at the cafe. What an affectation. He's got the corduroy jacket, you know, he's got the 60s era headphones. He's just trying to get attention. But the LP is the coolest format out there, and it still does things that CDs can't do. And if you think about it, think how valuable if you had hung on to some of your best LPs. Who's still circulating LPs? And almost nobody, very few people still have LPs. If you hung on to them, they could be really, really cool and valuable to your com community, except for the fact that every time you play them, they get worse and worse. It's not a good object for shared circulation. But we're at this point now where the very symbol of coolness is a record. You know, a DJ, an LP. When it came time for My Little Pony to show who the coolest person in Ponyville was, it's DJ Pony, right? She's spinning the hottest tracks, doing dates in uh, Las Vegas and Manhattan. Those aren't jokes, those are actually cities from My Little Pony French. So, now, uh, yeah, you got something really interesting here. Cool people looking at old formats, right? Do you see this? Do you get cuneiform hipsters? No, it's, it has a limit. You can't go that far back. You don't see people trying to play the wax cylinders at the, uh, at the coffee shops. But it's a very important thing to realize that formats don't disappear just because they get outmoded, right? Obsolete and outmoded aren't the same thing. Obsolete means that it's completely gone, it's been replaced completely, uh, it's gone. Like a candle, right? A candle's disappeared from Earth, right? No. No, the candle's still here. Every kid on Earth knows what they are. They will be a part of human society for centuries yet to come, even though it's a lighting technology that can kill you and your family if you leave it unattended, <laughs> right? But they're still here, even though they're obsolete. Now, what's important to remember is the candle industry now is a lot smaller than it was when everyone needed them for light. So it's really about the industries and what happens to the industries, much more than it is about the formats and what happens to the formats. So here we are in our river of content. We have these lovely shores with books. We have a pile of you know, degraded and worthless video and audio media off to the side. And there's something new coming, and it has a message for libraries. <laughs> right? The ebook is here, and its message is, screw you, libraries. Right? There's not really any question about this. The problem that the ebook was designed to solve is us. Right? We're the hole in the publisher's business model. We'll talk more about that as we go. But, let's see, what's going on with this slide? I think it's just a blank slide. Oh, there we go. Okay, so let's review on the codex. So first you had the illuminated manuscript delivered from on high, right? It was gorgeous, laborious, so extremely precious. Then 
the block printing came along, and of course the illuminated manuscript lost all of its economic value almost immediately. It became something that was so ridiculously expensive no one had invested. And then, from block printing, you went to letterpress. Okay, so the letterpress came along, and here's a first edition of Pride and Prejudice. You can have pictures printed in them. It's much less laborious. Look how much crappier the paper is. That Gutenberg Bible, that Gutenberg Bible is 500 years old. Still looks white and gorgeous and beautiful because it's vellum. It's actually animal skin. Well, as this got a lot cheaper, it became pulp, right? Pulp yellows. There's a whole acid-free thing, all that stuff. So the quality went down, but the cost went down too, and as a result, a lot more people read them. They got out to a lot more people. So then we burned all the Gutenberg Bibles, and along came the paperback. And when the paperback came, <laughs> now, we remember. You know, it's funny because people say, well, this has never happened to the book industry before. But if you talk to book industry executives who have been around long enough, They'll say, you think this ebook stuff is tough? This is nothing compared to the paperback wars of the 50s. When the pulp paperback came out in the 1950s, that's why we have the big six instead of the big 87. Mm. It destroyed so many publishers because all this cheap crap came onto the market. Mm -hmm. It was at such a low price point, people snapped it up like crazy, and the market for big, expensive works evaporated overnight. Right? This is exactly what's happening right now. So now where are we? We're at the situation now where a lot of those first editions have disappeared. All we've got is cheap, crappy paperbacks. And now there's something new, right? This new device that's here to try to change everything once again. But what problem is it actually trying to solve? You know, what problem are ebooks here to solve? It's a difficult thing to say. And there's a central truth that libraries who, uh, we've become convinced that it's critical for us to chase the shiny thing, right? If we don't chase the shiny thing, then our public will lose interest in us. Never mind 3,000 years of history that prove that that's not the case. Now suddenly there's a shiny thing, and if we don't have the shiny thing, we're not going to have it. But there's a fundamental fact in ebooks that I want to make sure is that if there's, you remember nothing else about today's talk, I want you to remember this. Ebooks are bullshit. Okay? In every single possible way. Ebooks exist to solve one problem, and that one problem is duplication, right? You cannot stop ideas from being duplicated. The publishing industry thinks they're going to avoid what happened to the music industry. They are wrong. We should not be investing huge amounts of public money in systems that have no other purpose than to restrict access to information, right? This is crazy. Our descendants are going to laugh as much about this as we laugh now about things like centrifugal force delivery tables. Right? They used to have this idea that they put pregnant ladies in labor on a spinning table and it would help the baby come out. We're laughing, right? That's ebooks. That is ebooks. The notion of a digital file that only one person can use at a time, it's crazy. We should not be investing in them. We should not be embracing them. And you know, the other thing about it is right now, ebooks are a transitory format. They're only popular because the publishing industry refuses to embrace any other formats and because they have a temporary convenience edge. A temporary one. Do you remember what else had a temporary convenience edge? <laughs> Anybody have one of these? It was really useful for a couple of months, right? And then, now it's one of the biggest preservation problems out there because the drives don't work anymore. And if you kept your stuff on this zip drive, it's the same thing. It's like, oh, I have backups on my floppies. Yeah, that's not a backup. That doesn't, that doesn't help. And we are not going to see zipsters embracing that format and thinking, now, here's the other part about it, right? Um, okay, I'm going to pick on one of our sister state libraries, all right? Connecticut State Library is doing a big new ebook pro pro program. And in their press release, they said, ebooks are growing like crazy. It's the wave of the future. Ask publishers if ebooks are growing like crazy. Ebooks have flattened out completely. In fall of 2013, there were less ebooks sold than in fall of 2012. Is that an adoption curve? You want to know what else? In fall of 2013, there were more hardcovers sold than in fall of 2012. This is not an adoption curve, folks. This is a fact. Do you know now, I'm not saying that ebooks are, that I'm not saying that digital print is a fact. I'm saying ebooks, the things we now call ebooks, with DRM and the specialized devices and the locked in ecologies and the walled gardens, is garbage, right? Here's the other thing about it. Uh, this curve looks a lot like another curve that libraries freaked out about about 30 years ago, the audiobook. It was going to replace all reading. People aren't going to read anything anymore if they can listen to it 
Why would anyone take the labor to read when they can listen to it? And there was this belief when the audiobook started getting popular that it would replace the book, just like the way we're here people talking about ebooks right now. Did the audiobook replace the book? No, not at all. It had its niche, it grew to fill that niche, and it plateaued. Right? There's a little bit of increasing use of, e of uh, audiobooks, mostly because people have to drive more to get to their jobs, right? <laughs> but the reality is, ebooks are not the shape of an adoption curve. Okay, let's look and see if we can find an adoption curve. Does Blu ray have an adoption curve? No. Nope. Blu ray doesn't have an adoption curve. People want to stream their media because discs are too much of a pain in the butt. How about tablets? No, there's an adoption curve. That's what they look like. They go up like this and they don't come down. All right, this is use of tablets and smartphones. That's an adoption curve. People get confused because they think that people are reading ebooks on these devices, and the data says they are not. The percentage that people are using these devices to read ebooks is decreasing, not increasing. Right? Let's not all climb aboard a train that's stopping at the next station, never to go anywhere else. All right? We need to be very careful about how we invest public money in this century. Here's another another thing that a lot of people um, miss. Especially, be okay, so there's print, right? It does not equal newsprint. Print and newsprint are completely different industries. And the utter sad state of the newspaper industry is not a harbinger for what happens to books. You know why? Because newspaper is intended to be thrown away tomorrow. Right? That's what it's for. Or maybe you put it on the floor of the birdcage first to wrap a fish in. Right? These are things you would never do with a book. Right? And Books are durable goods. They're intended to be reused. The other thing is, the content of the book is not worthless tomorrow. Where the content of the newspaper, other than from a historical perspective, is worthless tomorrow. It's news today, it's history tomorrow. A book is what it is the whole time. And the other thing is that we think that the newspaper industry is falling apart because people don't want to read newspaper and print. Now, while that's part of it, the real industry, the real problem that the newspaper industry is in so much trouble is because they built their entire business upon fleecing you on classified ads. <laughs> and all this, this guy did was he came along and said, you know, it doesn't cost anything to make classified ads. Maybe it shouldn't cost anything to place them. And poof, the newspaper industry evaporated. Now, we need to remember that the newspaper industry was structurally in this position because they started decreasing the cost to obtain their, their document below the cost to produce it. They did that at the turn of the century, not this one, the last one. That's when they stopped having, you know, it used to be that every town had multiple newspapers, right? You bought the one that agreed with you, right? Like Facebook. Then it went from there, where they realized that if they stopped taking a particular political position, they would reach more eyeballs if they sold it cheaper, below the cost that it took to produce it, they'd reach more eyeballs and they could make money by monetizing that to, new, to advertisers. Except the reading public got a lot more savvy about advertisers and they started, again, they used the classified ads as the engine to monetize the entire business. It didn't work. So now we're in this situation where, okay, we need a solution for digital text, right? If only there was some sort of system, some sort of standards-based method, some sort of universally available global net network for distribution of text that everyone had access to, if only there was something, something that could distribute text without all this info, all right, we already have it. The web is all you need to distribute all the text that everyone needs in this century. And the reality is that an ebook is a web page with a lock on it. That's all it is. It's exactly like the wooden horses that they sold to attach the front of the cars because they thought that the cars were going to scare the horses. Right? This is preposterous, right? They were convinced that every car was going to need one of these. There were even some cities that passed ordinances requiring these, right? Just like the attempts to get legislative interference in the ebook business. I'm telling you, right now is not the time to be asking Congress to help libraries. Right? We are not going to get the result we want. And if we attempt to get them to force publishers to do business with us, you know, that's like, okay, we all have this experience at public library events. You know, when, uh, when the parent brings up the kid and says, no one will play with my kid, make someone play with my kid. Right? <laughs> that work. You know? So we need to remember that. The other piece of this is that when you see all the whiz bang, gee whiz stuff that ebooks are doing, this is what the web was doing in the late 90s, early 90s. The future of the book, when you see people talking about the future of the book, it's the past of the web. 
The web's already been there, and by and large, it's been discontinued because people didn't really like it, right? Flashy stuff, it's not a big deal. Now, the other thing to remember is that we are right now in a golden age of reading and writing. More people are reading and writing on this planet than have ever done that in the history of humanity. And we're worried about the future of the book. Just because less people are reading novels doesn't mean that reading is in danger. And a big problem for libraries, especially public libraries, is prizing the reader of genre fiction above all other patrons, right? It's like a Parks and Rec department that's like, baseball, 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 right? Well, there's a lot of other things that go on other than just baseball at a Parks and Rec department. And we are in this golden position where we can be a part of the future, but we're investing in the past, right? Ebooks are totally about the past. There's nothing about the future where controlling publishing is a, is a profitable venture, right? Publishers are taking way too large of a slice, a slice of the pie. Uh, when you look at it, you know, a publisher will routinely take 70, 80, 90% of the revenue of a book, right? What do web-based businesses look like? Think about eBay, what percentage of the sale do they take? 3%. Can publishers have Times Square offices on 3% of the revenue of their sales? <laughs> So this is a, this is the, the challenge that's happening right now is really a challenge for publishers. It's not so much a challenge for libraries because we've been here for our communities and we'll continue to be here for our communities. And if we can just not worry so much about making those noisy patrons who love genre fiction happy, then we'll be in a much better situation. Now, in the case of academic libraries, it's mostly already passed this, right? Print doesn't make sense in an academic setting other than for historical collections. All the journals, all that stuff. Well, the, there's an entirely different problem of fleecing when it comes to academic <laughs> journals. Right? But there's this new movement happening, which is the idea that information can't be property. And this is a really sharp generational line. All right? uh, there's a wonderful story about um, Bing Crosby had movies, like movies that he made of baseball games. And it turned out that in his collection was a lost game. It was like game seven of some World Series in the 60s. And it turned out that in his collection was the only existing copy of this one very important baseball game from the World Series. His grandson found it. And his grandson posted on YouTube. Because that's the way that he receives value from information. If it had been his son who found it, do you think he would have posted on YouTube? It was taken on straight to Sotheby's, right? Now, the actual artifact probably still went to Sotheby's, right? Because the artifact has one type of value. The information has an entirely different type of value. And geez, I mean, you know, you remember the taper? He who likes his taper in mind? The beautiful thing about information is that you can give it to someone and still have it. The 20th century was a saga of trying to keep that from being true. From the copyright wars, from the, el from the early days of uh, the 78s and the piano rolls, all the way up to the battles of the early days of the internet in the, in the 90s. The 20th century is entirely about trying to insist that ideas are property. When we get to the far off future, the 20th century is going to be a black hole of information. Because that stuff that is not digital, that was printed between 1923 and 2000, will probably never become digital because copyright law and the Mickey Mouse curve. Everyone know about the Mickey Mouse curve? That every time Mickey Mouse comes close to being in public domain, you know, copyright gets extended? Well, at some point, this is all gonna change. And this is the bigger reason behind the ebook problem, is that many statewide projects are leading the way toward a model of ownership that is not at all ownership, right? If you have obtained a permanent license to something, and that license tells you what you can and cannot do with it, that is not ownership. It's a permanent license. Now, maybe all that libraries need is a permanent license. But man, libraries should not be the ones defining ownership downwards. It does not need help from libraries being defined downwards. So when you see, the other thing is that you have to remember that a license is a contract. So say that you sign a license with an ebook vendor, agreeing that you will let their ebook out one at a time for time memorial. What happens if future copyright law says we don't have to do that anymore? It'll happen someday. When that happens, you still have signed a contract that says you have to do one person, one item at a time for time and memorial. So in many cases, libraries are giving away future rights in permanent license agreements that otherwise would come to them. You know, there's going to be a Copyright Revision Act sometime, I'm guessing 2026. 
that's probably a, a, a realistic. We, there's a few more. <laughs> Grim Reaper's got to help us a little bit more before we get on that. So the other thing, let's think about the music industry. People say, well, the music industry is doing this. Well, music industry has found a way to make some money. But the music industry peaked in 2000 with the CD, and it has not recovered, and it never will. And it's the same problem. The publishers are extracting too much value from the equation. Do you hear young garage bands talk about getting signed? No. They don't want to give it up. They're aware of what they give up by doing that. Because when you get signed, you still got to pay for the recording time. You still got to have pay to have the CDs pressed. You still got to pay everything. The only difference is there's a guy in a suit who takes two thirds of your money, right? Bands increasingly aren't interested in doing this, and the independent band is becoming the big deal. However, do you know that the first independent number one song actually happened in the 90s? It was Stay by Lisa Loeb. Her song was independent. She did not have a, she was not signed at the time that that song hit number one. Now, of course, she was signed within a couple weeks. But at the time, she was, so this is starting to happen. Uh, Thrift Shop is the other one. Thrift Shop was a major independent release. There was not a label involved. The problem isn't content, the problem isn't media, the problem is publishing. And in libraries, we feel so close to the publishing industry, we feel their pain. But you know what? Well, I've, this is my favorite thing. I've heard librarians say to me, these publishers, it's like they're in it for the money. <laughs> yes, and you should never forget it. We are in the business of setting information free. They are in the business of keeping information scarce. Because without scarcity, they can't sell it. The values, it's just like the De Beers and all the diamond piles, right? You know, the De Beers manufactured the diamond industry single-handedly by keeping warehouses full of diamonds off the market, right? And by insisting that a man should spend a third of their salary on a, on a diamond engagement ring. They invented that. You know, prior to 1900, there was, no one gave diamond engagement rings. This was something that the De Beers decided would happen. And like a bunch of suckers, we all went along. Me included. So, <laughs> so this is a really dangerous time for us to be putting all our eggs in one overdrive basket. <laughs> the reality is that Amazon could decide tomorrow that they're done doing business with overdrive. Adobe could decide tomorrow that they're done doing business with overdrive. And any dime that you invest in your overdrive collection ceases to be accessible to you at that moment. All right? Never, and that, those are just the, the contract problems. Everyone remember the, uh, the Adobe Digital Editions authentication server outage from a couple of weeks ago? Yeah. Everything broke on the internet because so many systems depend on Adobe Digital Editions. Uh, people, couldn't, people who had paid money to use Photoshop couldn't launch Photoshop because Adobe's authentication servers were down. Is that where the money should be invested? No. The other thing, and this is the, the parable of radiator springs, right? You know, if you, it doesn't matter how, how nice you make your little slice of town. If the interstate goes by next door, you can decrease your visitors substantially. And here we are with these major systems coming into place that are exclusively using technology that has no purpose other than to restrict access to content. And you've got libraries investing hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars of public money in embracing these systems. It's nuts. So here's the thing. Here's this bend in the river, right? We think that we're all, we were always about books, now we're always about ebooks, right? We're gonna transition from one to the other. No, that's not what's happening here. This isn't a bend in the river, it's a delta. This isn't the time to transition, this is the time to diversify. Reach a larger audience, provide more services to more people, and frankly, let the genre of fiction readers, who are mostly affluent anyway, buy their books on their Kindle and be fine with it. It's not a now, we know, libraries know, that we, the role that we serve for people who don't have the means. But right now in America, that's not something you can perch your value of your institution on, right? It's our secret mission in uncharted space. Our secret mission is to help people who don't have the means. We know we do it every day. But that can't be what you perch your value on. Because I don't know many city councils that are interested in that kind of thing. I don't know many provosts that are interested in that kind of thing. And I don't know many you know, school superintendents who are interested in investing in that kind of thing in a big way beyond the entire existence of the organization. So, we're going to spend now about half an hour looking at what that actually means. Now, I want to set this in perspective. So, Ann Arbor is certainly an affluent community, and we are a well-funded library, but we receive about $75 per capita for our service area. We serve 160,000 people. 
Uh, and we have a $12 million budget, we have five buildings, okay? So it's a distinctly medium-sized library system. But if you make a chart of funding levels of libraries in the US, we're right in the middle. There are a lot of libraries that have a lot more money than us per capita, and a lot of them here in Illinois that have a lot more money than us per capita. So the biggest thing that we've done to enable everything that you're about to see is by saying that the person on the desk doesn't need to have a library degree, okay? If librarians are professionals, and I don't doubt for a minute that they are, why are they sitting at the reception desk? When you go to the doctor's office, is there a doctor sitting there waiting to help you? No. The doctor's time is carefully managed. You might get to see them for only 30 seconds if you only need them for 30 seconds, right? We need to stop using librarians as clerks because if you put the librarian on the desk, what's the best thing that might happen? They might help one person with a really important question that isn't where's the bathroom run jam the printer that day, right? They might help that one person. But if they take them off the desk, they could create in that same amount of time a single piece of content that could be used for the next 500 years. Right? Which is a more valuable use of librarians' time? So most of the stuff you're about to see, we got the money for this by stopping believing that we needed to have a librarian on every desk. Most of our now our librarians do work the desk four or eight hours a week. All the rest of the time they're doing projects, creating permanent value, not ephemeral value. So let's look at what some of this looks like. Start with diversifying collections. Libraries of books were effective economically because books were scarce and rare economically. And if you, you were providing access to something that wasn't available anywhere else. Now, books are everywhere. They're literally, literally flying through our heads in this very moment. They're all over the place. They're at the grocery store, at the checkout, at the drugstore, at Best, even Best Buy, the electronic store has some books, right? They're everywhere, they're ubiquitous. They're getting cheaper and cheaper. Many of the most independent up-and-coming young authors are releasing the digital versions of their books for free because they understand that they're worthless. Bits don't have economic value like things do. This is something that the dot-com generation is trying to make not be true. But bits don't have economic value. Only atoms have economic value because bits can be infinitely duplicated and you can't have scarcity in that presence. So, what does this diversified collection look like? Circulate the things that are scarce and rare. Certainly things that people can, can't get anywhere else, not things that are all around them in giant piles everywhere they look. So this is our circulating telescope collection. We have 30 telescopes. It's an extremely popular collection, very doable. Uh, then we have a music tool collection, synthesizers, acoustic instruments, guitar pedals, amplifiers, all kinds of stuff. These are things that people can't get anywhere else. We have this instrument called the piano cage. Sounds like an arcade music, has a joystick and buttons on it. This is bespoke, it's made on Kickstarter. There's only a few of them in the world. We got one in our collection, of course, it disappeared, but that stuff happens. <laughs> <laughs> a theremin, circulate a theremin at your library. It's so fun to play. It's like a fellow. it's easy to learn and impossible to master. So we circulate the theremin with a book about the theremin and a DVD featuring a virtuoso theremin uh, performer from the 30s. Because the, the theremin was the first electronic instrument. And still the only electronic instrument, the only instrument of any kind that you play by not touching it. It's super fun to take home. The kids are like, I can play with my butt, look! You know, so it's a lot of fun to get this out in people's hands and people get really excited about it. It's not that expensive, it's not that technical but it's really fun and it's something that they can't get anywhere else as opposed to something that is everywhere. Um, another few examples from our science tools and home tools collections. Indoor air quality meter lets you measure the CO2 levels in your home. A wireless energy meter system. A lot of libraries do this in conjunction with the uh, you know, energy coalitions in their town. But in many cases, we're asking them for money to provide this. Why can't you spend collection budget on things like this, right? Is your book cert going up? If the book circuit isn't going up, maybe you should decrease the amount of the budget that's spent on books in response. And you free up room to do things like this. Uh, thermal leak detector. In Michigan, this is a very big deal. You have this little thermometer, you point around your windows, and it shows you where the leaks are. Very valuable. You don't need to own one. You only need it for a week. Uh, infrared thermometer, very similar. We also have these science tools and art tools collection. We are circulating a human skeleton. His name is Stan. We didn't name him that. All classroom skeletons are named Stan because they're all cast of one guy, and his name was Stan. So this is Stan's skeleton, available for checkout. And they may not have taught you in library school how to fit a human skeleton into a hockey bag, but it's something that we're doing at ADM. <laughs> we're circulating a spinning wheel and a drum cart. We're, we go, and we also have uh, the, what's that crazy thing that goes with the spinning wheel? The nitty knotty. You know what a nitty knotty is? It's this little thing you use to wind the skein. Uh, we want to have all the stuff that lets someone go from sheep to sweater. 
<laughs> they can't get these things anywhere else. And a sewing wheel, you know, spinning wheel costs like seven hundred dollars. And it's a big gamble if you don't know if you're going to like it or not. But if you can check it out at the library, and try it out. That's a unique opportunity. You can't get it anywhere else. You know what? The library has this wonderful infrastructure for checking out and checking in physical objects. We are all we have to do is put a little barcode sticker on it, and it's ready to go. We don't talk to the catalogers about it. They don't need to know. <laughs> Sewing machines are something we're just starting to get into, and microscopes. All these scopes. You have oscilloscopes. All kinds of stuff. Diversifying collections to find the places where value does exist, instead of continuing to ex in insist that value exists in things that have become outmoded or where the distribution chain has bypassed us. There's not another place in your community where your public can access these. Whether it's a school, whether it's an academic setting, whether it's a public library, these things have a lot of value. There are libraries, there's a regular here in uh, Chicago. Skokie has got a great collection of this kind of stuff. They circulate GoPros, little cameras like the, the crazy guy who jumped out of the balloon. He had like 18 GoPros strapped to him because he was sponsored by GoPro. You can check one of those out at the library and jump off the top of the house or something. You know, whatever you want to do. So getting things that are unique instead of things that are ubiquitous. So then it comes around to the digital collections. It is definitely possible for libraries to offer unique digital collections. The catch is, you don't want these things to be things that are already in the Amazon store and already in Google Play and already in all the other stores. You want them to be things that people can't get anywhere else. So an example is we've made a deal with a local record label called Ghostly Records, and we license their entire collection for a set term. During that time, unlimited DRM-free downloads by our users. Okay? This is a very sustainable digital model. And basically the contract says that we will pay you a flat fee for your entire collection to be available for download by our logged in users. Not check out. Checking out a digital object is crazy. No marketing materials can make it not be crazy. <laughs> Checking out a digital object is crazy and everyone knows it. Right? It's when you get the people come up to you at the desk and say, I'd like an ebook. And you say, okay, well, you can get on the whole list and they say, no, I want an ebook. <laughs> right? This isn't helpful to us. The best, the thing about ebooks and the systems that are currently out there, and all, none of them are any better than any other, is that it gives new patrons a great opportunity to find out how much the library sucks. Right? <laughs> That's a really bad thing. Even the new, geez, on the way here, I was trying to put my money where my mouth was. I checked out Coraline from Overdrive so I could read it on my phone on the plane because I hadn't read it before. It was not in order. Okay? I don't know if it wasn't in order. So I gave up before chapter two because it wasn't in order. And we know how many of our patrons are having these experiences every day, and they don't tell us because their expectations are so low in the first place. Right? But it's possible to license digital materials for unlimited, unencrypted download, and the patron gets to keep it, right? Because the library still has it. That's the beauty of digital materials. So we have this wonderful collection of ghostly records. We have another big collection called Magnitude that we've licensed on these terms. And this year, we're getting into books. We licensed from Cherry Lake Publishing 750 nonfiction books for kids under this model. And here's the best thing. We licensed it in such a way that five years after the copyright date, the library has a permanent license to distribute permanently, at no additional cost. So we have these items forever, for as long as we'd like to provide them to patrons. And these are good stuff. And the beauty of it is, the entire school can check this out onto every device right now, immediately. 800 copies, right? No special software. You know what you get when you click download? You get a PDF. That's what you get. You can go on any device, any computer, any anywhere. You can share it, right? These things, it is possible to have licensing agreements that do work for libraries. The catch is, this took us going to the publisher and negotiating the deal directly. Mm -hmm. This is not the time to be introducing more middlemen mm -hmm. into the equation between how content gets to libraries. There's already too many middlemen. So that's collections. Now about production. I increasingly feel that the greatest value that libraries can provide is in what they produce more than what they collect. Because libraries are in a beautiful position because we don't have to make any money on anything, right? We can produce content for which there is no business case. A library that brings a new document to the web that would never have existed on the web if it wasn't for the library's resources has created a permanent expansion of the corpus of human knowledge. Does our overdrive subscription meet those criteria? Are we permanently expanding human knowledge by having, you know, extra copies of a Dan Brown book? 
So, not knocking Dan Brown, Dan, everybody look at So, diversifying production. We have several podcasts that we produce at the library that are original content produced by patrons. Comics Are Great is a show that a local patron makes. He's really enthusiastic about comics, and he makes his show for other comic artists. He comes into our studio and produces it twice a month, and he has an audience of hundreds, right? But this content wouldn't have existed otherwise. We also have another podcast about maker stuff called Maker Hub, and uh, this is something that local makers come and talk about what's going on. It's making the library be a tool of production and distribution, creating stuff that wouldn't exist otherwise. But it's not just sort of the podcasting, and this is a lot of fun, it's also about real history. We have a partnership with the African American Culture and Historical Museum in Ann Arbor, where once a month we set up our equipment, and they bring one of their elder citizens in to tell their story. They get asked the same questions that were developed by an ethnographer, and they are asked this question, we videotape the whole thing, we post the entire thing professionally produced on the web in its entirety, and we send it out for transcription, so that every word of that video is in Google's index for anyone to search for. This is extremely valuable, and nobody will ever make any money trying to do this, which means if you leave it to the commercial sector, it will never happen. But the library is investing its resources in preserving the information of our community, and it's not just you know a city. It works just as well on a campus. In many cases, a library that is a campus library is extremely well positioned to be the asset management system for the entire campus. Right? Typically, that winds up with IT. Right? But the library should be the one driving it. The other thing about this, it's extremely inexpensive. We use a great company called Three Play Media. It's like it's, uh, I think it's a dollar dollar ten per minute. You know, so it's very inexpensive to have something professionally transcribed. And the value you add to that is huge. Plus, now it's accessible. You don't have to be able to hear to get the information out of this. Another example uh, is the our old news project. We took possession of the Ann Arbor News Archives when the Ann Arbor News went out of business. Uh, we took their whole archive and we've been steadily digitizing things. One of the best things about it is we have about a million photographs that have never been published anywhere. That is where the value of libraries truly comes in. Not in having a copy of something that there's thousands of copies all over the place, but having a copy of something that does not exist anywhere else and wouldn't be on the web, the web unless you put it there. Uh, another example is uh, 40 years ago, uh, in 2011, there was a very big event in Ann Arbor, uh, the John Sinclair rally. John Sinclair was a young man who sold two joints to an undercover officer and was sent away for 10 years. Um, they had a freedom rally to try to get him free, and John Lennon and Yoko Ono played. It was John Lennon's first performance in the U.S. since the since the Beatles broken up. Abby Hoffman was there, Stevie Wonder, uh, 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 what's his name, Steve Miller. Uh, all kinds of big, big names were at this event. Um, and so 40 years later, we collected as many of the attendees as were still alive that we could get together and got them to tell their stories. We also staged a, re a revival concert. We also digitized the crazy newspaper that the hippies were producing during that time called the Ann Arbor Sun. That newspaper doesn't exist online other than the fact that we brought it to the web. And, but I'll tell you, you know, you might think you, that digitizing newspapers is easy, but when the articles are shaped like this, and there's a big mandala in the middle of it, it's a lot of, OCR doesn't like that. Now, as part of our newspaper project, as we were going through it, we came across a film canister. And we opened it up, and this is what we found. I'm going to show you a little bit of it. So we found this silent movie that the staff of the Ann Arbor News had produced in 1936. Now it was silent because they were using hobbyist equipment. Even though there were already talkies in the 30s, they were making fun of the movie conventions of their youth, just the way the kids they would make fun of 70s game shows, right? And also, they didn't have the technology for sound movies and home equipment. So <coughs> what we did with this is we digitized it, and we performed the, uh, we staged the world premiere of this, a silent movie they'd never been seen before, and we commissioned the local organ silent film guy to perform, to compose an original score for this. Now, how many opportunities do silent film enthusiasts get to compose an original score for a world premiere of a film for the 30s? He was very excited about this, we did not pay him. So this worked out great, this is the recording of him playing the score that he produced for this movie in the Michigan Theater, or classic movie palace from the 30s. And this is a live recording of the world premiere of this. This would never have happened if it wasn't for the library investing its resources in something like this. Now it's a permanent part of the web, a permanent part of human knowledge. And it's hilarious. Uh, there's lots of smoking. There's a fair amount of cross-dressing. Uh, and it's all about them trying, we can relate to this in libraries, 
They have to get out there and sell one more column inch, otherwise those monthly stats will be slightly lower than the year before, right? And they can't have that. So this is a wonderful, <laughs> crazy piece. <coughs> this, let's show this. So you perform only work. Anyway, the whole deal. This whole thing is available on our website. You can watch the whole thing. Um, <laughs> it gets pretty crazy. So. Another piece on the flip side of, of a 1936 movie that the newspaper made is a recording of a Pokemon tournament. We staged Pokemon tournaments in the library, and for a while we were recording them so that kids could be a part of the game the way that they see it happen on TV. It was a part way for them to access a national audience, a way for them to feel, and they could point it to their friends and say, go look at this, watch this battle that I did online. Now we don't have to do this anymore because the kids are bringing their own devices and recording their matches themselves and posting them themselves. So, another part of that is uh, we have been diversifying the experience of using the library in that uh, trying to make the experience as different as possible, something for everyone. Of course, libraries can't be all things to all people, but they can offer something for everyone. And especially for a public library, everyone in your community paid for the public library. Everyone in your community should be able to find value in the public library, whether they like to read for pleasure or not. So, this is an example of the National Smash Tournament we've organized for years now. Smash Brothers, uh, we do this for International Gaming Day in November. We uh, had 45 libraries from across the U.S. having their champions trying to compete against other libraries. And it's so big for the kids in the room, rather than it being, oh, that guy won, I hate that guy. It's like, that guy's our champion. He's defending our honor against those jerks across the river. <laughs> it's a great way to build them together and for them to feel that the library is the home of their community. Another big piece is our summer game. I've got a whole separate session about that, so I won't talk about it too much, other than to say that uh, the big takeaway is by taking the word reading out of our summer reading game, everybody read a lot more. And it's a very cautionary tale for libraries. For the read, 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 drum beat is inherently divisive. And to make it more inclusive, you get a lot better results. I'll talk about this some more later. But part of that is badges and earning badges online. And I just want to do one quick thing about badges. Academia gets badges so terribly, terribly wrong. Don't let someone who's got a PhD tell you what badges are for. Because if they're in an educational pedagogy program, they don't know the difference between accreditation and achievement, right? To them, those terms are synonymous. To a person who has an Xbox, accreditation is bullshit and achievement is important, right? Those are completely different things. And badges are not to accredit people for having skills. They're to demonstrate an achievement. That achievement can infer that the person has the skill. But badges should signal achievement, not accreditation. We don't just want to turn them into letter grades with pictures. So that's partially diversifying the experience. A little bit more about it is uh, we have also made the library a two-way street. So we get as much information coming from our users as we give to our users. That's about writing reviews, also moderating reviews. Also, tagging old photographs. A lot of our community knows things about our photographs that we don't know. Or even OCR correction. We give them pretend points for helping with our OCR correction. And we, as a result, we have very high quality OCR because we tell them that they got one point every time they type in a word. Right? That point isn't anything. It's just a number. But people like points and people like scores. Uh, another example, uh, we had an Oculus Rift hackathon last summer. Oculus Rift is like the dream of the 90s is alive again with things you strap onto your face. Um, <laughs> Facebook bought it, so it must be crappy. So when you're looking at the Oculus Rift, we had a hackathon where teams of developers had a weekend to make a game for the Oculus Rift. And then we brought in members of the public to try the games and vote for which ones they thought were the best. Oculus sponsored this, NVIDIA sponsored this, we had some great prizes. And most importantly, we offered our patrons something they can't get anywhere else, an opportunity to try one of these crazy things on and see if it makes them vomit or not. <laughs> Another big part of this is, with our, again, with our gaming program, is uh, we had a team of Germans come to play against our kids this summer. Uh, actually, it was spring of 2013, so a year ago this spring. And these kids won through a German library gaming league a trip to the US to play against our gamers in Ann Arbor. So they fought their way through their city tournament and then at the, the German Nationals in Wolfsburg, and they won this opportunity to come play against our players. And after five games, the score was tied at 320 levels. Oh, so we brought out something weird and made them play this, which is called Johann Sebastian Joust. And it's a game where you have to try to knock each other over. So yes, libraries can bring Germans and Americans together and make them fight. <laughs> It worked out very well, it's very fun. Here's another example. Take the content that kids are into 
and may give them new ways to experience it. This is our Angry Birds event. So we worked with the county to get use of a gym, because we don't really have space like this. We bought some cardboard boxes and balloons and some slingshots. We had a bunch of crafts. We had tons of summer game codes at the event. And this was huge. We had 500 kids come to play Angry Birds Live. It was really not a very complex event to put together. It was mostly just giving them a new way to engage with the content that they already love. And there aren't Angry Birds books, thank goodness. <laughs> but you know, Angry Birds is such a big deal it's kind of over already, but a year ago when we did this, it was really hot. <laughs> uh, another example, this has got some audio. So this is our Nintendo Gaming Classic Night, and this is Super Mario Brothers side-by-side -side speedruns. So we took the game and turned it into a race. They might have played Super Mario Brothers at home, but when you put two of them together, then they can play a race, and it's something, an experience they can't get anywhere else. Here's another example. This is something that we funded last summer at the top of the park, which is an outdoor festival. Uh, this is called Superhero. It's a thing that was, uh, they, it was invented by a Spanish company. They brought this, and basically on our bell tower, you kids can fly around. They hold it like this, and there's a connect that faces them, and they fly around in a huge version just by, and they can shoot at each other. They see themselves 30 feet tall flying up there on the screen. Um, this is not an experience they can get anywhere else. And for the library to be a part of it really redefined their ideas of what the libraries are. And this kind of gets to a... So watch him get really big. <laughs> you can see the contents of his stomach there because of his t-shirt. So um, one of the things that's really great about this is, you know, this audience, millennials and below, we got them. They already have a much bigger definition of what a library is. Really the problem that we're facing right now is boomers and because boomers are in power right now. And boomers had mean librarians. And so they, they don't like libraries because they were treated poorly by their libraries as kids, right? So there's all this stuff built up against it. We just gotta make it through the next 10, 15 years because the generations coming up love libraries and they don't have any rules about what a library is or what it isn't. It's a place for them to go and do what they wanna do. And there's nothing else like it in their society. So while we're at that, here's another shot. We, um, we had these little branded flashlights made to project our logo, handed them out so that everyone could make sure that they knew who brought this to them. Another example, uh, the Star Wars Reads Day. This is something that the Star Wars publishing people put together. So we just got a photo booth and rented a Darth Vader costume. I made my sys administrator wear it. Other duties as a sign. Um, so this was a really great opportunity. The kids can come and experience Star Wars, and it's a really fun thing. Another great example is uh, Kids Read Comics. This is a convention that now we've staged. This is our third year doing it. It's a kids' comics convention. Uh, this year, Matt Holm of Baby Mouse and Squish was our guest. Uh, we usually uh, have had Dave Roman and Raina Telgemeier. Raina Telgemeier is going to smile. He's got another big book coming out. So we get some of the big names in kids' comics. And it's not just like they come and get their signature and, work, and you know, like, you're awesome. They teach labs. They sit down and draw with their favorite artists. It's not saying, I'm the creator, you're the consumer, consume my output. It's, I'm the creator, let me show you how to be a creator, too. And that's really big for kids. We just had this. So then we also have our Kids Comics Revolution Awards, which are national awards for the best in kids' comics. Kids' comics art artists are starting to get really excited about this. And uh, it's a very big and exciting opportunity for them. And this is a shot from our awards. It was just this past weekend. It's Vordak the Incomprehensible. is a kid's book uh, character and our own local busker, the Violin Monster, who came and uh, helped our handle one of the awards. So when you diversify the experience of the library, you reach more people. You do more things. It is entirely up to us what the library is or isn't. And people say, well, what's the mission of the library now that books are, well, you know, the library, the mission, the mission of the library existed before books. It will exist after books. We existed before commercial publishing. We will exist after commercial publishing, okay? We just have to stop saying no to ourselves and let ourselves try things and see what's sick. It's okay if it doesn't work. It's okay, and, and the thing that drives me crazy is I often hear from libraries when I, when I show things like this, I say, well, what happens if 60 people come? Well, then it worked. Mm -hmm. Then it was a success. That's good. We shouldn't shy away from success because it sounds like a lot of work because that's why they call them jobs. So here's an example. <laughs> this lady, look at her. She's, she cleaned us out. She's walking out with a happy drum and a bunch of synthesizers. She's taking all this stuff home for a birthday party. She's For her birthday, her kid's birthday, all she did was go to the library, check out a bunch of stuff, and take home and let them play with it. Easy birthday party. You don't have to go to Chuck E. Cheese and suffer in that hell. So, <laughs> they, 
Have you diversified the experience? You have video. This is uh, we're just playing Mario Kart against another library, so we just opened up FaceTime so the kids could see who they were playing. You can't do this in the game. You know, this is something that doesn't exist. So they're playing Mario Kart, and they can see who they're playing against. So, what's the outcome of all of this? What change is happening in the library from all kinds of expansions of library value and services? It's diversified value. It's for superheroes and supervillains, for, uh, <laughs> for the high society and the servants who help them. It's for dog people and cat people. It's for uh, Darth Vader and Jedi alike. It's for Kerbals and Minecrafters and Angry Birds alike. You can reach everybody if we just stop saying what a library is or isn't internally. So one more thing, just to kind of wrap this up. So when you got the book, this is what we thought the library was, it was the book. It's still got a lot of value. It's not going in, it's not going away. It's still a valuable part of it, but it is not the thing that millennials think of when they think of the library. For them, the library is what they make of it. This is literally our library built in Minecraft by our patrons. We run a Minecraft server, and on our Minecraft server, we've invited the community to make a model of the town. And the first thing they built was a library. And it, of course, on the inside, the shark tanks and roller coasters. Which is what they want the inside of the library to be. And why not? Why can't we have a shark in the library? Why can't we have a roller coaster? Then this is just another view of it. Now, here's just another example of the way that library economics can work. We had a little leftover hardware money, mostly because we don't buy personal computers for the public. We do not provide personal computers. We provide thin client story. Cost per station is below $500. A lot of the money that would otherwise go to replace a piece of crap Dells every three years, instead buys, for a third of the price, buys something that lasts five times as long. With that money, we can then take money and buy something like a $16,000 projector, okay? This is like a movie theater projector. Just by having this, it has opened up so many opportunities for partnerships across the, across the community. And the library has this thing. We took the public money, we aggregated it, we invested it in a shared resource. That's what libraries do. It doesn't make so much sense for media anymore. But if you get something that is truly scarce and valuable, it can really work. And next thing you know, you find your projector outside, projecting a huge game that somebody made on the middle of the street festival. And your logo's on it because you funded it. You made it happen. So, sum up. Libraries of all types, school, academic, public, need to look outside the commercial world to provide value, not within it. Because libraries have always been outside commercial value. Right? You always hear, if libraries didn't exist, it wouldn't be legal to create them. That's never been more true than it is now. So libraries have always been outside commercial. So stop worrying so much about what we can buy and what we can't buy. And think about what people need and what they don't need. Right? Because that bend in the river just might be, instead, a big verdant delta opening up to a big ocean of possibility. So, that's my talk. Thanks for listening.